Hello and welcome to the Cuyamunga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the executive director and president of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the director of research, education, and outreach, we want to thank you for joining us today. Um, the Cuyamunga Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution we recognize to thrive, we must take an open approach. So we continue to invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. That's why we call it Conversation for Exploration. And on these um, Sunday weekly discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics from the arts to the sciences and everything in between. And you're welcome to visit our website at cuyamungainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, of course, we invite you to become a supporting member. And we want to thank the community members who continue to support the mission of the Cuyamunga Institute. Modern day scientific discoveries looking at the interconnection of humans to the outer world around us continues to challenge and expand how we see ourselves. And at the same time, we have seen this connection represented in ancient cultures for thousands of years. The main discovery is this, that everything consists of energy. And the further we go, researching atoms, or neutrons, etc., the more open space and vast energy fields we find. From the microcosm, to the macrocosm, there's a corresponding similar patterns or structures between human beings and the universe. This concept that man is a smaller representation of the universe, like the old axiom, as above, so below. Therefore, there is a profound need to embrace this direct extension and connection of the human experience to an environment. One does not exist without the other. And we know we can harness this energy also that surrounds us. Our bodies are designed to be like an antenna to receive energy. But like an antenna, we need to tune in so we can adapt and practice and open our bandwidth where we can harness the energy around us. Our experience shows us that when we move and hold the bodies in certain positions with intention, we can activate this field that provides us with energy, information, wisdom, and direction. And let's face it, we're all born with the same physiology. Whether we're born in the middle of the Amazon or the middle of America, we all have the ability to further recognize, embrace our role in the extended world that surrounds us. So let's not miss out on that full spectrum of the human experience. You know, um, Tesla, Nikola Tesla said, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. And indeed, um, this is the theme of our talk today, but really it fits so nicely into our overall theme, which is why we call this conversation for exploration. We're all on this voyage of discovery. With each conversation, it's like opening a gift box. Each of us in our own way, on our own path, are pursuing what the meaning of life, our own life, our collective life together, our society, uh, the life of the entire biosphere, that's the society. Life itself, such a miracle. And this greater sphere of the cosmos, is it a fertile, creative womb supporting life on levels we can't even yet imagine? We're compelled to explore, to seek, to question, to expand for the joy of discovery, for the aha moments, for this high of celebrating the world around us. Stretching our minds is as key to our well-being as flexing our muscles. We've had a discourse on the senses um, beyond our five standard senses, and we've related them to our trance work. And I know many of you in this audience aren't, uh, really don't know what our work is, just that we like to explore the greater, the greater world. And you might hear us talk about it, and I really want to take it out of shamanic terms or ancient terms, and I really want to put this in science terms, artistic terms, and look at the fact that we are a piece of inner technology. And today's conversation is about the inner technology that we inhabit. We are like a readout dial, a, a meter that reads out 
the experience. And what is that experience? We're going to make some deep speculations, but I feel that we have poetic license just to put some things on the table and ask, is there a connection here? And so we're going to put a lot on the table. But part of this is that we have this inner technology and we're going to look at it like an antenna, a transmitter and a receiver for the subtle energies of the universe. Mm. It's a way that our ancient ancestors have gone exploring, have recorded what they found, if you know how to decode it. And it's a way that we still own, as you were mentioning, we still inhabit the same physiology as they did. We still have these active sensory apparatus within us that is picking up more than we know, more than our five senses tell us in these subtle realms, and it's registering us. I'm positing that that input, that download, that conduit is um, at the heart of some of our experiences today, and we will put some science to it, but I just want to say that beyond our everyday five senses, in these visionary states, which is not, by the way, our physiology being hijacked by drugs. We're not taking any. It's the physiology producing this. It is the technology being turned on in these additional ways, in these additional states, quite naturally, wholly within ourselves. And the question is, from what source? Mm -hmm. And what is the mechanisms, the apparatus, by which this inner technology is picking it up? We're going to relate it to the hardware out there in space. But first, I just want to say, and before we introduce our artist who so beautifully renders that in a visual sense, right. I just want to say that um, these extra subtle senses that we have go a long way in explaining <clears throat> what we have. Science is now finding there's so many. We feel a magnetic pull like a tractor beam <clears throat> often. Sometimes we shrink down to a tiny point. Other times we are expanding as large as, it, as the earth. Maybe sometimes simulta simultaneously. We can feel grounded and solid and as heavy as a mountain, and we can feel as light and devoid a substance as air. We can travel very fast. We can travel through water. We can travel through space. We can travel, mm. um, we can fly. Uh, that's, yeah. Our senses converge sometimes into synesthesia, and they're cross-wired. We have direct knowing, the utter conviction of that still small voice within. Don't doubt it. It's telling you something important. We have energy surges and pulses and waves shooting out at the top of our head, taking us along for the ride, having us wonder exactly what socket have we plugged into for this exactly. So we have so many of these beautiful experiences that I think of as this state temporarily overtaking not only our five senses, but all these subtle senses. And it can happen in art. There are so many, it can happen spontaneously. I think art is one of those conduits in which um, artists say, I get into the zone. I hear the muse on my shoulder. Mm. I am also downloading information and expressing it in these ways. And that is one reason why we do so many art projects right after our visionary states, because we've already opened that conduit up. What mm. does it want to say? What does it want to be expressed? And so... As we look today, as we look today and say, hey, we have an inner technology, and we also, it seems to me, quite often create and invent technology in the mechanistic outer hardware way. As reflection. That, yeah, that's exactly doing the same thing that our inner technology does. And maybe it's been lying dormant. I think that we have lying dormant a lot uh, going on for sensory apparatus that was once highly activated uh, in our early stages of our human story. And lying dormant, for whatever reason, we are rediscovering them today. We're rediscovering them in the science, looking at some of that sensory apparatus in the other members of our web of life, from insects to reptiles to fish to vertebrates to mammals. Um, we're finding that it's there. So you and I have a report on that later. But... Um, I want to say that we're bringing some threads together. We're bringing past and present. We're bringing the arts and the sciences. We're bringing the inner technology that we own, this kind of soft tissue that's holding its own power that we have yet to understand fully, with the hardware that is being invented and deployed in space to what? Open our bandwidth. 
And so this is the theme of our talk today. We're going to look at these different aspects of how we are opening our bandwidth and uh, finding more on that electromagnetic spectrum and what it has to teach us and tell us and amaze us and display for us. Because our eyes, our ears, our, our common senses see such a tiny slice. Mm -hmm. And then I think in the trance state we get activated or the news, so many ways of getting there, we open it a little bit more. And now we've got hardware and space opening it even more. Mm. And it's all looking at this cosmos. And I think we're going to find it is, as the messages that we receive, intelligent, fertile womb of creation. Mm. We are part of that creation. So all that we do, it seems to me, in the arts and the sciences, all the human endeavors, the dance, the trance, all of it is about celebrating this magnificent universe. Mm. And I think this is a beautiful way to start off the year because this is the mission. Celebrate. That's how the scientists started. They had Newton out there going, I want to see the handiwork of God. I want to understand it. Mm -hmm. And part of it is to understand ourselves. <coughs> and if there's anything that I can do and Paul can do as the directors of this institute, it is to make this work accessible to all of you and build a bridge and say, come play with us. You're invited. Uh -huh. Not a request, it's invitation. You're mm. invited to come and explore in this way because you own that technology and mm. it is glorious and it has much to teach us. So I want to get back to today's panelists. I just wanted to mention that when you, yes. make, when you started talking about that, that the, the reflection of the, the hardware, the technology that we're building outside of ourselves, and then I'm yeah. reminded of uh, the invitation, uh, the uh, introduction to the James Webb Telescope that Tony talked about a week or so ago, um, and that whole idea that they send it out into space, almost like a prayer, and then, oh. and then, and then it opens up. Oh my God, and then it it's gets, unfolded. And it unfolds, yeah. I just oh. I had that vision. That, uh, so so we'll even have, gesturally, that yeah. is a beautiful gesture to send out a piece of technology. Yeah, just, it goes out and then it opens that. up and all the mirrors open up so it yeah, can receive. Yeah, capture the, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, all right. So let me tell you who our panelists are today. And again, we're bridging the arts and the sciences. So we have uh, Cindy Good. She is an artist. We have an astronomer, an observational astronomer, astronomer Tony Hull. And uh, we have a report uh, la later we, we will give about the specifics that we're finding in uh, creatures here on Earth that are also opening their bandwidth. Oh, yeah. So it's not just we humans that are uh, graced with this inner technology. It's not, not many, 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 many all, creatures. Yeah. And it's purposeful. Mm -hmm. My contention is we wouldn't have it if it wasn't to be deployed in a, certain, in a certain way. So in opening these doors of perception and widening our bandwidth both internally and externally, we're going to bring these realms together today. We're going to draw comparisons and connections. We're going to speculate on this age-old quest to experience more, to explore more of our universe. And in doing so, we're really exploring ourselves and our place in it through the arts, the sciences, technology, to see how what we invent and create in our hardware, in our mechanics that we shoot up into space, may be an imitation of what we already own and do. And it might be self, more self-referential than we realize. And uh, this apparatus we're going to compare with other uh, creatures, including ourselves. And uh, it's, I think we're going to find that we're all tuned in to our planet and her biorhythms in these obvious and subtle ways by design, nature's design. Very kind of her. We are tethered to Gaia in ways that we have yet to understand. We have yeah. an artist uh, today. Let me introduce her um, first, our first member of this panel, Cindy Good. She joins us from Sydney, Australia, where it is like past 4 a.m. And Cindy's a member of our community. She joins us in her Monday um, <coughs> as online Zoom <laughs> sessions. Uh, because for down under, Australia, Singapore, New Zealand, it is the next day, Tuesday afternoon. So it's a very compatible uh, Tuesday hour. morning, morning. Tuesday yeah. morning, yeah. 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 So welcome, Cindy. Good to see you here. Good morning. 
Good evening. <laughs> hi, hi, good evening. We've invited Cindy because um, she does these exquisite paintings as part of her journaling. So part of our process is to go have a visionary experience and then share it with one another mm -hmm. and see the correlations that we've had. And uh, Cindy will always hold up her journal with these most beautiful drawings and I'm like how does she do this in the 10 minutes that we have to journal the and things, then also write it up yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say one of the things that we found as a, a, a significant component of our work is journaling and when you think the word journaling you think about line paper and pen following lines we said wait a minute the ancients journaled the entire time but they wrote on the cave walls they sketched yeah. <laughs> they gave us better representations of how of their experience and so we always invite people you can step off the page you don't have to have lined paper you can just journal whatever comes to you and cindy's one of those people that well, and because jumps symbol on that. and an image are universal yeah. we can read them even through the eons we can read them through the uh, cultures we uh, can we don't have to speak the same spoken language it's a universal language so, so. and it, i think it pings on us in some deep deep ways that's another discussion so cindy you have uh you're we're going to show because you've sent us some of your images we'll do a slideshow of your artwork and we're going to end with a particularly significant um telescope related image oh yeah that is going to help us introduce our our next guest the telescope expert okay uh, but let's start with your slideshow cindy and no, no. First you of all, are first of all you're exhibiting somewhere in sydney what is the name of your show currently on display okay. Okay, it's um, called the Avalon Centenary. So I live in Avalon Beach in Australia and it's a hundred year anniversary. And it um, is a show where local artists, this community is quite small on the ocean. And um, most residents have got an arts background, directors, musicians, uh, actors, uh, artists, all types Hot of bed mix. For the arts. Hot bed for the arts. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. think it was a hippie colony a long yeah. time ago, but it's very artistic. Yep. So why don't you kind of do a little commentary as we go through and show some of these? Absolutely. They're just yeah. exquisite. Yeah. Uh, there we go. So there's Cindy. And these are your uh, moleskin journals, which you travel around with. And this is where you your canvases are portable right there in your hand. Absolutely. That's why you're so proud. Absolutely. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so love the old moleskins and a little pink kit, which I'm going to show later. But oh, yeah. Um, I, yeah. wherever I travel, whatever I'm doing outside, I love that. Now, this is Avalon Beach itself. And oddly, you said as above, so below. This was actually during the lockdown period. There's oh. these ocean pools and you walk around the corner and most people don't walk around the corner and explore their world. And that's a very um, that's a depiction of an ocean pool. But below that was these starfish. Fish. they're called sea cushions and they were of various colors so this um what i depicted for this show was as above here's the avalon beauty that we just visually see but have you ever looked below that have mm -hmm. you ever seen what is actually going on below and that you can get lost in that universe and those animals oh beautiful yeah Look at this. And this is in what, acrylics or what? This is oil. I paint oil, oil. on board. Oh, wow. And um, very, I have a limited palette. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy just uh, capturing what I feel the essence of the area is. So the palette comes out of just a feeling and I, I, I keep it limited so that I don't get lost. And there's the below. So there's Stars. these little creatures about the size of your hand and they're sea cushions and they've got patterns. If you actually zoomed in, they've got little tiny patterns that scroll out like the universe, almost like a black hole. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I love how it's replicated everywhere. You see we the live. patterns in all fractal levels. Yeah. Yes. And these are, <clears throat> again, the sea cushions picked up on these gorgeous rock beds and this is a pretty accurate depiction of the colors that are occurring there and look how they're arrayed and like stars this and so is here we are talking about the cosmos this is perfect <laughs> yeah. exactly. their, their, their exactly. level yeah. oh, fun yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so fun so it just seems to reflect up then through then down and back up again <laughs> 
And this is a series I, I'm quite well known for my figurative work. This is oil, again on board. And there's a lot of people that do what was called ocean swims in Australia. And these are depicting the people that do these ocean swims. They're pretty, pretty, um, you gotta be pretty fit to do these ocean swims. And they swim around whole corners of a, a peninsula. And um, this is an active swimmer in the dark, deep ocean, just pulling. And that was called pulling ahead. Mm. And this one is called Treading Carefully. And this, uh, what is, was built, and you see, it's over, I think, 75 of these rock pools you see there, which were concreted in in the early 20s when people were afraid to go into the oceans. And you see them scattered along the coastline wow. of Australia and Sydney. And this is on the outside. They're treading carefully across the rocky outcrop. But inside, that's where a lot of people swim because uh, the ocean can be quite unforgiving if you're not uh, familiar We're with visiting, swimming. Uh, Shelley and Graham, and they live near Avalon of the Gold Beach, near uh, Sydney in the edge. They had a cement pool there. And I thought that was curious and what that was. Thank you for explaining. That was uh, Yes. And it's very unique to, to mm -hmm. Australia. Well, uh, these the are my jellyfish, and yeah, I can see yeah. <laughs> dangerous creatures everywhere. Yeah, especially Australians. Um, so we, this is a sketch. So this is one of my sketchbooks, and I think this is really interesting. That was a local paper um, in Greece, um, just uh, charcoal, some paint, and really just <clears throat> what I find with sketching is. It takes the perfectionist out of you. You just sit down. These are done quick, five minutes. Um, I think what I love mostly about sketching outdoors is people start gathering around you and they get curious about what you're doing. And um, they sit with you. Sometimes I'll, I'll let them sketch in my book just to see what they come up with because oh, everybody can sketch. Lovely. Yeah. So that, again, is Greece as well. I love the watercolors and how delicate and the, the different shading with the drawing. Oh, that's that's a lovely. Sometimes less is more. You don't need a lot. It just kind of evokes. I think what what you, I find artists, uh, most artists I speak to, we just and have as, this feeling. And, and this as, is as as we mentioned, yeah. we have everyone journal as part of their experiences, and so Cindy has been great at about not only journaling but having the art to go with the journal, <laughs> both side by side. And so this is one of her journal experiences from August of last this year. This is what she wrote up because we were so intrigued by this paper folding thing. Oh, and, yeah, she held and up. And also you had the griffin before and then it came through. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about this, this experience, if you would like? You gave us yeah. permission to show it. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, that's, um, I, I know the physician actually started mentioning the griffin and sometimes about a day or two before um we do a trance posture there there might be things that come in during um, mm -hmm. my quiet time my early morning meditations and i just started uh drawing this griffin on avalon head and then we went and did the posture and i was quite amazed at uh it appearing that it was one of the postures and then i started doing a drawing that you saw this fold out that was depicting uh, a message but I think what surprised me is it went origami on me. It kept on folding and folding and folding into a fish, which also was part of what the, the actual object was found and part of its story. And I think that's the beauty, I think, of why um, when I do the trance work, I, do, I don't use words because I just fall into this vision, this seeing, and let it run through me. And all I do is, is remain an empty vessel, hollow bone, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. and just completely empty to what does it want to say? How does it want to express? And words I find sometimes limiting. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. And so that was imagery just does it. So that was where Cindy, we asked her to type up her journal notes oh, yeah. and include all the whole story. Hmm. Because we do like to document all this for the archives of our institute. And when um, somebody was that beautiful and, and elaborate, yeah. th that was your report. Thank yeah. you. And so then so, more sketches. Tell I us a bit more about these sketches, then we'll hit on the one that 
that is really um, to our talk. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this, these two sketches here are, um, I do, I do a lot of um, work with uh, animals, shamanism, uh, taking journeys with them. And uh, that, that uh, sketch you see here is a little backstory, a quickie. It was an initiation um, ritual that I undertook where I actually entered a dark uh, underground cellar for a period of 24 hours with just a headlight, a bucket <coughs> and a torch um, and a, a pad of paper and a, and a pen. And I was asking what my magical mysterious character was. And I filled this book with these rolling images that came up in this trance state. And the next day they all coesced together into this face and you'll see at the left hand side this small raccoon face mm. which is really me as a child to the other side which is me as an adult woman mm. and uh the green man who I knew nothing about but I listened to a beautiful lecture of yours the other week I was profoundly moved by that antlers mm -hmm. um and the nose and the rock uh forces the heart the owl and all of these animals at eagle feather have meaning um and in their pure beingness when we look at them mm. so Beautiful. this That's was an interesting deprivation sensory deprivation method that you were doing right it sounds like yeah. so it to was really just cut out all other um input and then see what your own mind can conjure. Yeah. And that is that is interesting because in a similar sense, in the short duration of our trance, closing your eyes and you're asking for data to come in, imagery to come in, input from a different source to fill your visual screen. Mm -hmm. So there, we can relate it, whatever the technique you describe to that. I mean, and, there's so many ways. And in conjunction Absolutely. with some of our... Some see, of see anew within oneself. Go ahead in conjunction with some of our workshops, we've actually gone to the extra step of blocking out the entire Kiva windows and having pitch black experiences yeah. as well. So that's, that's yeah. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Very oh. interesting. And, okay. and that's actually morphing into a mask. So I've been, uh, I'm actually creating a mask of that. So I'm taking ah, it 3D. Yeah. And I will send you a picture of that when it's completed. And oh. when you place that mask on, I'll be interested to see what transpires. Mm. Well, it's interesting how many times the uh, antlers come up with the with the wild man or the green man, you know, yeah. it's such a yeah. yeah. And so we'll continue. It's with... like there; those archetypes and those motifs are there in our collective uh, conscious. Even line paper can't control you. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, then, what's, and this is from your trance journal, isn't it? I re I recognize this one. What's this story? Yeah. Uh, okay, this is the trance journal, and this one was. I'm just looking it up. Um, Oh, I don't have the name of the trains in there. Mm. I'm going to have to refer to you, but that's interesting. I usually write the name down. Um, that was on the day that I actually saw a 22 degree halo over my head. Ah. And I got in the car and I came back um, because it was quite amazing. And then a gold thread through my head. And then I came right out of the car virtually on time and did your trance <clears throat> and it kept on expanding mm -hmm. what I'd visually seen mm -hmm. as you know the, the I'm sure Tony can explain it much better but I've never seen a, a, a full rainbow 22 degree halo like mm -hmm. that it was incredible yeah mm -hmm. wow yeah, good timing yeah yeah, yeah. So I, I think I would I'm also going to mention that everybody journals and everybody can do, you know, this isn't restricted to someone being an artist that in this process. We have made people so they haven't touched a crayon since they were 12 years old. Now are this, sudden, yes, this like, space bring your crayons that. to our sessions and see what happens, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, here's another experience with a bear and, uh, yeah, stay in love's presence. Yeah, and that, that one stay in love's presence yet yeah, that just kept on morphing out <clears throat> like an energy field going out but there was i i sense the body changing into a shape but i don't really know what it is and what's interesting is i i don't engage my mind and what happens is it starts to draw itself mm -hmm. so i often mm -hmm. it's not a it's not a cognitive brain link of of visual like when i paint and I'm looking and reproducing. 
um, it's actually having a full, complete trust that it's drawing itself. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a beautiful state, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. many artists yeah. describe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and continuing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, I see I see glimpses and clipses of things, um, and and uh, I feel my body actually morph it, like I can feel it grow wings or do things. So I'm actually depicting what's actually changing or what I'm seeing myself morphing into and sometimes images fly at me so i just again just capture it i guess there was quite a few words coming down in there um yeah. yes transforming physical form to spirit form. and, I, and I'll, yeah. I'll also mention mention that we only allow like eight to ten minutes for journaling mm-hmm. for each session and so, how you do these so, so you just move get oh it done God. yeah you, just, you i just move to intellectualize it you just you're no, in the, the flow point. there's stuff creative juice flowing you let it flow and yeah. I've yeah. mentioned several times in, in previous programs how sometimes I'll do the uh, the session and I'll go to the piano and do yeah. music, create music directly yeah. afterwards, create art directly afterwards. And at the Institute, we, we lay out all the paints and the papers and the clay <laughs> and so everybody can come out and everybody can just go play immediately afterwards and see what happens. Yeah. Here's an experience okay. that she this drew is... recently when we did for the, solstice. for the solstice. And why did we choose this posture for the solstice? Okay, the solstice was about reaching up, right, and honoring the, the pause of the sun and the seasons and the cycles. Oh. This is the Venus of Galgenberg. It's, what, 32,000 years old, found in Germany, Paleolithic or Ignatian artifact. Yeah. Exquisite little figure, so delicately carved so exquisitely conveying that we know exactly the posture and it's a complicated one you put your face this way you bend one leg you turn your torso here you're doing this we um actually are not holding our arm up for 15 minutes on its own we use a pole sometimes uh, or we use a wall um well i mean if you have really good muscles that i sure our paleolithic yeah. ancestors did you might do that for yeah. but you know we use an assist because we don't want to be in pain but I, I could read some of the experiences, which I'll do maybe later, uh, mm. but they're all about, I'm a transmitter, I'm a receiver, I'm downloading energy from the cosmos down into the earth, it's my duty. Cindy, ex- describe your experience and, and, your, and your, take us through your, your exquisite sketch. drawing um, okay. from your experience, your journal. Well, well intuitively, I got um, to hold a birch staff. So it's a piece of birch wood that I was holding. And in my other hand was um, a Peruvian flute uh, uh, yes. that I office, often play. So I, I got told, you know, I just intuitively, I'll pick those elements up as the props as directed. And as I went into the posture, I actually could feel my hand opening up like a spiral, like a black hole. But this incredible, huge energy from the cosmos coming through my hand and then a screen over my head seemed to appear. That's that line you see. Mm-hmm. And it was like, watch the screen that comes down. And, and then it goes through your own, our own head, our own, you know, whether you want to call it third eye, brain, whatever you want to call it. And then it started directing down. So it's all this as above, so below kept on happening. And it was unfolding and saying, be careful of what you think or what you feel because you scream. And then it wanted to project back up of what we do on earth, back up into the cosmos. And that we're so related. It was just to infinity going on and it was a massive surge of energy and a weird fractaling that was happening um and i just you know again when i started and it was a lightning rod that came through and that we are all open to this we are all open to sensing this and i see that screen as a as a really i don't it's a function of that screen in our mind mm. that we process it on, like the matrix, right? A lot of energy data, but we see this whole scene and we know that's not reality. It's photons coming in, energy waves coming in, whatever it is, but we're, we're creating So that, that's so beautiful. I think that's the screen that the language of spirit is writ on by the universe and that it, it downshifts it for our benefit that we relay on. That's how I would interpret that, especially from all the other experiences that we've had. But yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Lauren. 
I, I feel like it was what our perception will dilute it to, how open we can be, um, and, and, and it transcribes in different ways. And yeah. the more we open the bandwidth, the more we see and experience full senses, full on yes. sensory. Yeah, that we are that instrument, the dial readout, and it's glorious to inhabit this, this yeah. A couple of people so, are asking questions about more details about the Venus of Goggenberg. And it, oh. Just put it in Google because there's so much data and information. It's such yeah. a well-known artifact. Uh, well, that's why we say we can trace this work back to the Paleolithic back. I think our oldest artifact that we use is 40,000 years old. And so for us, the fact that we can activate these in this way, um, and there's a whole story on the physiology and right. body posture, Being and, encoded. and we can trace it. Um, we're saying that this work goes back at least that far and probably farther right. because it works, right? It yeah. works. And so your experience, um, I can relate to many experiences, but I want to get over to Tony. Um, but that sense of we are transmitters, receivers, we are mm. a conduit. We have a role here on earth to parlay that energy from the cosmos and transduce it, transmute it send it to Mother Earth and back up again, that we are that liaison, we get that lesson over and over and over and over again. Hmm. And um, yeah, yeah. so yeah. Um, it's so beautiful and we see it. Now, I will say that Tony, we, we to celebrate the solstice, we invited Tony Hall, let's bring Tony here, um, <clears throat> to, uh, I said, Tony, we're going to celebrate the solstice, the James Webb just launched, or is about to launch, this was right. the before, 20th, 20th, right, yeah. First. And so Tony gave just a tiny little talk to celebrate it. So the idea of telescope was in the air, but Cindy, I think that your experience mm. was, um, I hope it wasn't led by that in retrospect. I hope it was organically grown by yeah. that. And so many, so many were. And we've done this posture for 20 years, yeah. and it's always the same. Hi, Tony. Tony, welcome. And uh, well, thank you. Tony yeah. is a fellow artist as well as an observational astronomer, for those of you who haven't met Tony yet. And I said, oh, Tony and Cindy, you have much in common, telescopes, and <laughs> you're both artists who travel around the world with your paint set uh, at yeah. hand. And so yeah, uh, do you want to show us your paint sets? Let's yeah, just before. compare you both as art. <laughs> Isn't that <a> darling? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Open yours up, Tony. What's inside? So. Yeah. Tony, Cindy yeah. has described kids, yeah. how darling Cindy has <laughs> described how she goes and invites you know whoever she interacts cafe, with. Yeah. Tell us your story of how you paint, because you're okay. a but scientist as well. before we transition well into the full satellite well conversation, conversation. Yeah, yeah, we just have good to trend. do this part. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. sure. Well, well, I before COVID, I traveled maybe too much. Uh, uh, in nineteen, I had twenty two trips, including two lecture tours in Europe. So, so uh, I'm away a lot, and I, I having dinner by myself a lot and I go to to uh, sidewalk cafes a lot and and I'm never lonely if I take paints with me <laughs> and, and and a little bit like Cindy I I have at, at the farmer's market in in Mainz Germany I passed the painting all the way around the table and everybody contributed to it An <laughs> awful painting but a really great memory that's uh, so, so beautiful really. so, so so I, I have a I have three rules when I paint. One of them is, uh, first of all, I allow myself to only make two marks from the site I'm at. After that, the brush leads the hand. It picks the color and it goes to wherever it wants to go. And I'm, I'm the witness to this, this. And then the third rule is never, ever try to make a good painting. Yeah. <laughs> that, that messes it all up. <laughs> Good rules. You know, and I would consider that a groove or a zone where you disconnect from your doubting and intellect mind. I mean, it has you the rest of your waking hours. Why not give it a break, park mm -hmm. it to the side, and see what other muscle comes forward, so whether part of our mind. And the, you both are describing this process to do exactly that. I see your processes very similar. Mm, yeah. yeah. So... Cindy's naughty. Um, I wanted yes. uh, Tony to share an extraordinary story about picking up the subtle energies in the environment to demonstrate that in the arts too, that's another avenue to open the bandwidth. So I'm gonna share, uh, uh, Tony, you wanna tell the story as we share these- uh, Oh, an image of one of his, his yeah, paintings? Yeah, a painting that has a beautiful- You wanna start with that story. in the in regular yeah. slideshow afterwards? Yeah. Okay, okay. I think it's on the end of your slideshow. I got it. Yeah. Okay, well, while Paul's pulling that up, um, 
I, I ha I'm a creature of habit. I, I'm doing, I'm at a conference in Edinburgh. So what do I do? I find a restaurant and I go there every night. Well, I found a curd restaurant. Uh, it just happened on me. I was walking by and somebody walked out and invited me to come in. And so every night I would go to the, the same restaurant um, and I would do, I would sit in the same seat and I would do a painting. Uh, but last night there, um, uh, this is the painting that happened. I don't know quite why it happened, but it just happened with the, the uh, material which I, with the way I told you about, uh, it just appeared. And then the owner came over and said, oh, you have painted the curd flag. <laughs> and I thought, oh, how interesting. And then I was invited to stay after the restaurant closed and danced. I, I, I will save oh, you the fun. video of me dancing, but it was really pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you wanted, if you're curious what the curd flag looks like, Paul went and pulled a, an image. Oh, uh, yeah. And indeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we're celebrating the stars, right? right? This is yeah. uh, this is that <laughs> star array. Yeah. Wow, the sun. That's beautiful. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. So, um, so I, I also have a lot of paintings where all of a sudden I start writing, and I don't. It's like I don't know what the next word is going to be. Oh, that's interesting. It's like the other world is having a conversation with me. Yeah. Well, I'm inspired to get the tiny paint set and, yeah. and a little book and just keep it around yeah, yeah, and, be yeah. and see what happens. I think the uh, idea, I mean, Cindy, you're an accomplished artist, but don't mind what it looks like. Don't try. Right. Tony get said, the yeah. effort out of there, like Tony said, but yeah. just let it flow. Never, ever try to make a good painting when you do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a way, I think art is a way of taking what's in our mind and putting it in a visual canvas for others to share much like writing or much like dance or much like song or poetry, whatever it is, it's to share, right? It's to bring it out and manifest it in this reality yeah, yeah. to yeah. open that conduit directly. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. Wow. I know Cindy's on a tighter schedule. So Cindy, do you have anything else to share before we, you want to hear Tony's slideshow on telescopes? Because here's what we asked Tony also. Tony. <laughs> You yeah. paint, and and you uh, you are tuned your own mind. You polish mirrors to, for NASA. Yeah, yeah to um, to pull down this bandwidth. You have joined us in our work. Thank you. Um, but also, you're an expert on telescopes and how we are deploying the hardware to increase the bandwidth. And so, I wanted to understand the various slices of the electromagnetic spectrum that that our hardware is out there in space pulling down and what it's showing us and what mm. it's saying to us. And uh, yeah. yeah. And, and just on a, on a side note, Tony, ha, ha, has the James, James Webb opened yet? It wasn't there supposed to be like a- No, six months from now. Oh, when it's, oh, it's at that its long? Destination. Oh, I didn't know it was that long. Yeah, that's, sometime, that's sometime off when it's open and phased up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we do have um, on the 30th, Tony is bringing a colleague, an astrobiologist from the University of New Mexico, where they both teach and operate. And there we're going to talk in depth about the James Webb okay. and what it does, how it's doing it more. In depth. And she's going to talk about what yeah. it may uh, tell us about the origin of life. She's an astrobiologist. That's what she does. We're going to talk about all the intricacies of what Good. science knows on the origin of life here mm. and uh, how we're searching for it out there and how mm. the James Webb is going to bring back a data from the first moments of creation. Yeah. Our creation story. We're right back to the creation story. So that's yeah. the, uh, the 30th of this month. Okay. We look forward to that. Yeah. And uh, thank yeah. you. But what can you, Cindy, oh. anything else? Then we're going to move to Tony's slideshow. Okay. We want to thank you for being yeah. a member of our community and bringing your exquisite oh. art and inspiration. inspiration yeah. And being such a delight here today and getting up so early to, to share your art. Keep it up. Um, it's always a delight we'll see <laughs> to ya. see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you want more of Cindy? Join our Mondays, yeah. our second and fourth Mondays of each month. Right. Those are open to anyone. 4 p.m. Um, uh, Pacific, folks. 7 p.m. Eastern. Yep. You figure it out. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, that works. Yeah. And uh, you're going to join the community host too, I think. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. I am. All yeah. right. So, we'll Thank see you, you next Friday. Yeah. All right. I'm going to turn right. off your camera, but stay with us as long as you can and leave whenever you need to. We appreciate your participation. It's been fantastic. Yeah. Miss, Mr. Hull, it's good to see well, you. So well, where well, do we well, start? Thank you. thank you. It's so so great here. I love how you talk about an open approach. 
and even something that's that's a uh, hard science the sort of thing which i can talk about in in professional meetings i can talk about here and and it's received and and this is quite amazing uh but i want to say uh right in the front end that i have two colleagues that happen to be on uh bob woodruff uh yeah. who who designed all the instruments on hubble ah. and uh and had the patent for the optical design of the James Webb Space Telescope, oh and God. many other things is on. And I'd like to invite Woody to uh, to join me in comments whenever he feels he could. I was going to coordinate with him, but then there were the um, the catastrophic fires in Boulder that oh, put yes, Woody yes. without power, without power, without heat, oh uh, and said, "Please don't even call me on my cell phone," uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he was. I had no power for fifty six hours. <laughs> oh, Woody, I'm so sorry. And uh, and also, Sherilyn, Sherilyn Murrow is here. Um, oh, and, Sherilyn, and, we have a project in the works, Sherilyn and, and I, yeah. on the goddess and Venus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Sher oh, it's good to have Sherilyn you both. Is a solar astronomer and an expert on, on public outreach and is doing amazing things to reach people kinesthetically. And, yeah. and so... Uh, so anyway, I'd like to invite uh, you two to comment whenever you wish. I put together a few slides that, that may be worth talking about. And, and okay. Paul, maybe we can uh, switch to that. Okay, let me uh, get the change slideshows here real quickly. And Woody, um, I just have to say um, our blessings yeah. to you and your community dealing with the fires. Yeah. And we invite you to talk about the Hubble and all the imagery uh, whenever you can. We would be so delighted. Yeah, yeah, please, so. one's things in my Thank way. You. And Sherilyn yeah. has a beautiful... Uh, talk on YouTube, oh, on our YouTube channel with GB Cornucopia about Chaco, Chaco and we'll be talking oh, yeah. with Sherilyn in the future. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, well, um, Cindy uh, uh, mentioned origami, and the Webb telescope is called the origami telescope because mm -hmm. it deploys, it folds and it deploys in a very, very interesting way. So I, I thought I would simply mention that. I'm going to go through some of the slides very quickly and some in more time. Uh, but let me first of all say that there are a number of ways of learning about things astronomically. Uh, I have focused on, on things that are far away, uh, but our own Earth, we can learn about the environment of our Earth by satellites that sample with uh, collecting particles, with magnetometers, with things of this kind. Uh, that's not going to be my focus today because this is in some ways similar to to the, the techniques that are used on Earth, uh, we have a Mars. We have Mars rovers, and the same thing happens there. Uh, I could talk about it, but uh, I wanted to talk about things that are a bit more intangible in some way, things that can be far, even very far away. And so, I'm going to talk about the ways we can know of things that are very far away. Uh, but we keep on learning more about that too. So that's another part of the story. Next slide, please. It takes it a moment to uh, start. Uh, no, and, and Paul was being very patient with me. Uh, this may be obvious to many of you, but we have an electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And this was the principal way that we, we through, the, uh, through the end of the, uh, the 20th century, have learned about, about things from space. The principal, not the only way. Uh, we have radio waves, and we discovered the remnants of the Big Bang uh, by by uh, calibrations that were done at Bell Telephone Laboratories, a, a wonderful story in itself. We have the infrared, which is really heat waves. And these are, are you notice how the waves are getting closer together. We go into the visible, you know, the red through the ultraviolet that, that our eye is sensitive to. And then we go into the ultraviolet, which our eyes are not sensitive to, but our skin certainly is. Um, we oh, certainly we feel heat, we, yeah. Yeah, you, you have, you have sunburns and you go down quite a range into the ultraviolet. Next, we merge into the X-rays and the gamma rays. Each of these domains, there are telescopes. Each of those domains we, we observe. And this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Next slide, please. OK, um, so I wanted to point out that what are these waves? They're not just um, uh, they are they can be thought of as the modulation of the electric field and the magnetic field uh, caused by by the excitation that's happening at the source 
And these can be thought of as two fields at right angles to each other. And you can see on the upper right hand corner of the diagram, which I particularly wanted to refer you to at first, which shows that they're perpendicular to each other and they propagate uh, in the direction going to the upper right in this figure. Uh, down below, you will see how the blue arrow points to where wavelength increases, and that's obvious. Uh, the, the, just beneath that, there's an article of arrow that shows increasing frequency, and beneath that, it shows that there is a temperature associated with increasing frequency. Where we go from uh, one degree Kelvin uh, all the way up to 10 million degrees Kelvin, as you go over to the right. So the information that comes, comes from different temperatures uh, for, for at least the thermal effects. There are non-thermal effects too, and that's probably beyond what you want to hear about today, but uh, I, I'll simply mention that. Next slide, please. And, uh, Looks like DNA me, patterns too, doesn't it? If, wow. if you see me bopping up and down, that's because my duty at my desk is to let the dogs in and out. They do this about every five minutes. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so okay. they'll let me hear about it if I don't let them out when they want to. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to show more clearly the cross electric field and the magnetic field of a light wave. Um, and you know, particularly we look at the electric field and how that, um, uh, how that is aligned. And next slide. So if, um, if there is a grid of some kind, uh, what is going to happen? Uh, what's going to happen is that the electric field only oriented in certain directions is going to go through, and that in other directions is not going to go through. I'm making something that's very, uh, very complex, uh, probably entirely too simple, but uh, Woody and I have been- That's our speed today, Tony, simple. Yeah. I've been involved in, in designing a, uh, a telescope that will be making polarization measurements and the physical properties that are happening in space, particularly around giant stars um, and, and other objects as well, tend to uh, make a preferred orientation. And this is called the polarization. And from this, we can learn about, about velocities and magnetic fields and all sorts of interesting phenomena that, that we would not know about otherwise. Uh, so we, we do know that, that particles, including electrons, uh, distribution of electrons, can control the polarization around planets, around stars, and even around galaxies. Uh, and then there are energy emission mechanisms, the synchrotron effect, for example, in space, which will produce a product predominantly one direction. We can measure this and we can begin to find out about the physical processes that are happening. Hmm. Next slide. Okay. Okay. You're making science well, class fun, Tony, by the way. Tony, can I, can I offer just a little tidbit there? Of course. Um, the, the polarization Tony is speaking about is the same kind of, it's not political polarization, it's polarization related to <laughs> the same as your, as your sunglasses, right? Mm -hmm. Your sunglasses will show a different amount of light coming through depending on, you know, if you turn them on their side versus if you, uh, you know, just keep them regular, you'll see a different amount of light getting through because light is polarized by reflecting off a surface like water or, uh, you know, a, a car. And so that particular orientation that Tony is talking about is, is, can be done by a lot of different light interactions with matter in nature. And so it's just, it's true that photons of starlight will also interact with the, the medium of space and polarized light. But that phenomenon happens here on, the, on, our, on Earth also. Mm, thank yeah. you. And so yeah. it has built-in filtration or bandwidth that it can open and close to let certain amount in. Right, and nature uses that property. Yeah. yeah. Well, 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 thank you. I had never thought that people would, would think I was talking about political polarization in science, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting uh, we use that term, though. It's, it's, it's a more it's, common usage, unfortunately, yeah, right? But, but <laughs> that, that's, how big, that's how big a nerd I am. And of course, polarization is a big part of my life and Woody's life, too. So, so mine, too, right? It, it, yeah. But we're, I'm in the outreach game. So, uh, you know, we're doing outreach for a polarimeter, and uh, we, we're understanding that people 
have this confusion, right? Yes, uh, terminology. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Sherilyn. <laughs> well done. Yeah. So, so what yeah. what happens? Or we look at a given object. In this case, it's a galaxy where where different interesting things are happening, and they look a little bit differently in each frequency. So this is information. This is mm, this wow. is how we can understand things that happen at different temperatures and different energetics. Um, next slide. So that was the same galaxy viewed yeah. through the lens mm -hmm. of the different spectrum slices. Wow. Uh, letting dogs in, excuse me. <laughs> okay. So so if you so, can go to the next one. So you can yeah, even dogs things. don't see in color, right? So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But you could even see in temperature, there are different parts of the yeah. the galaxy were lit up more so than others. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. telling you different, different uh, qualities absolutely. And, in different places. And we'll, yeah. and we'll be saying more about this on, on the uh, talk on the Webb Telescope. But Ooh, this is okay. an example that you may be familiar with. A, fire, a firefighter going into a, a mm -hmm. dangerous situation looking for a victim, and it's smoke-filled. Oh. And smoke... Uh, the smoke uh, reflects very strongly the light we see with the eye, particularly blue light and, and a little less strongly the green light um, and a little less strongly the red light. But you begin to go into the infrared and all of a sudden you're beginning to see through the, through the smoke and you're beginning to see, in this case, the victim that the firefighter is looking for. And, and this is why uh, night vision uh, um, goggles are used uh, for this. Well, uh, I wanted to go on. Next slide. It's sticking. One second. Oh, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, uh, this is now we're looking at the Orion Nebula. This, and you can see this um, uh, first on the upper left in the visible light. Then you look at it in the microwave and submillimeter. This is radio, uh, uh, very high frequency radio. You look at it in the middle infrared in the lower left and and in the near infrared in the lower right. And so you can see different things are visible in each uh, each wavelength, different bits of information. Wow. That's coming. So that's the same thing, but the just seen through the different s slices of the spectrum. And you're looking in some cases at, at somewhat different physics that are happening, different how yeah. the different things all come and play together, how thermal effects may play against uh, against the dynamic effects versus other other you, how flow enters in, um, uh, all sorts of things that are probably too much astronomy 101 for me to get into now. But but uh, let me let me just say there's a lot happening, and we learn a lot by looking at light. In, in the different uh, spectral ranges. Mm, it's nice to see it illustrated like that. Thank you. Okay, so we combine data. And next slide. And and Paul was responding rapidly, but we have we have Zoom. And here's an example of combining data. Uh, I like this picture here. You see three pictures on the upper upper right. Uh, you know, one picture is red, the next picture down is green, and the picture below is blue. Um, and they all look monochromatic because they are, they're, they're filtered to be, to be in single colors. But you notice each one looks a little differently. Mm -hmm. But if you know what the colors are, and if you add these together, you create color. Uh, this is very much what's happening um, as you look at your, your monitor right now. It's very much what happens in your camera. And this is what we do in astronomy. We'll, we'll bring things together uh, over often a wider range than the eye can see. And we begin to understand what what the uh, dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, what, it, what it really looks like from the, the super view. Well, and that we're receiving in our eyes, photoreceptors, these, these different wavelengths. And it's on that inner screen of our mind that we put it all together. Um, uh, yeah. Exactly. It comes together by some magic in our mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably something we could pursue farther. That's why I was so intrigued with Cindy's um, oh. image of that screen and her description of it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, one, of the, um, one of the things that we are looking at now are, are what I call multi messengers, and something happened, unfortunately, to shift this a little bit. So, but I can, I can unravel that. Uh, we're seeing the universe in different ways now than we ever have before. And, 
and I do invite um, see, I do invite uh, yeah the multi messengers were, got on two lines and that made everything shift. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, where does it? Which, where does it go? <laughs> messengers mess, messenger should go up up one where the dash is. Okay. Oh, that's okay, Paul. Don't worry about it. I, okay. I can talk through. Them. It's not a problem. Okay. Okay. All right. So. So we talk now about multi messenger astronomy and, and Woody or, or Sherilyn, please uh, come in if you like. We've looked at light in its various forms here. Uh, underneath that, I have cosmic rays and I, I think Sherilyn is, is fairly cognizant of these. And we're looking at a couple of species of these, uh, electromagnetic, particularly gamma and, and, and X-rays that are, that are counted as cosmic rays and they affect our our detectors, they affect our instruments that we try and build. And we also have energetic nuclei that, that come in and, and also uh, you know, affect the instruments we put in space. But there's both a signal here where we learn about the universe. Uh, sometimes we do that by balloon experiments in Antarctica. We do all sorts of things to do that. So there's both data that we learn about and also effects, uh, what we call space effects that we have to design around when we uh, when we construct an instrument. Uh, we also have neutrinos, which are very strange particles, and I, that's probably too much Astronomy 101 to go to go into that. But one that's really been in the news lately and, and is really, mm -hmm. really interesting, I think, is gravity. gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. And that is that we, we can sense things from far reaches in the universe, um, not by electromagnetics, not by particles, mm -hmm. but by seeing differences in gravity it's like if you're sitting someplace and you get a little heavier and a little lighter and a little heavier and a little lighter as the waves go through you mm -hmm. uh, you would not perceive it because the effects are extremely extremely small but they can be detected if you want to go to the next yeah okay so gravitational waves and again something's uh Going off the edge here, but that's okay. Uh, here, um, and, and this is uh, uh, taken from a Caltech page because they are very involved in in gravitational wave um, wave astronomy. Uh, here, the uh, uh, in this case, you see t uh, two sets of ripples, and you see how they're propagating. And and uh, this is from from an event or events, a couple of pebbles dropped into a pond, whatever it is. Uh, so the, we see also ripples in what's called space-time and um, or the fabric of the universe to get uh, a little bit poetic. Uh, they're caused by massive objects which have extreme accelerations. Is what is an extreme is acceleration? It can be the collision, a collision like two black holes uh, spiraling into each other. It can be two neutron stars coming together. And, and I, I used to remember an analogy, Sherilyn May, that, that, <laughs> that a neutron star is so dense that a teaspoonful would have as much mass as the entire city of Chicago. <laughs> I think I remember that. Yeah, yeah, wow. I, I'm asking Paul, when a dog barks, why does he think it's me? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good koan for today, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, uh, so uh, next slide, please, Paul. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, wow, now we're getting well yeah. the uh, it's changed in our computer, it's taking a long time for his computer to show it. So Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Here we go. Uh, okay, yeah, this is the, the LIGO experiment which which is ongoing. This is that that discovered the uh, the merging black holes in, in 2017, oh. there was a huge event where uh, two neutron stars uh, spiraled into each other and coalesced. Uh, this happened when this happened, I would say over 4000 optical astronomers dropped everything else they were doing and tried to understand and look for where this was and, and do different ways to uh, determine exactly what the object is. Uh, it was unprecedented. It was amazing. Uh, and so what we have are, uh, are several observatories on Earth. There are a couple in the United States. There's one in Italy, I think one in Spain. 
which are these extremely long evacuated tubes with what's called an interferometer in, in them. And as one end vibrates with respect to the other in, in the very minute amount, because the path length is, is long, they can determine, hmm. they can determine the, um, that, that, that this is a gravity wave passing through us all and by having multiple ones and multiple orientations, they can determine from what direction in the sky this comes from. And, uh, and that's the key word. This stuff passes through us as well. It's passing through it does. everything. It does. Yeah. And uh, we're anticipating that Lisa will be coming up. Don't go back, Paul. That's fine. Uh, Lisa will be a space version of this. It's being headed by the European uh, Space Agency. Uh, but NASA is involved, and, and I'm involved in that as well. So, wow. well, gravitational waves, this is sort of um, um, interesting, so I'll, I'll not read it all, but, but two astrophysicists in 93 received the Nobel Prize uh, uh, for their 74 discovery of a, a binary par, pair of neutron stars. They were located um, fairly far from Earth, Seven years later, they tracked it by radio emissions, and they found out that the period of rotation was changing. And, and then it was noted by two other colleagues that, um, that it was decreasing exactly in a way that general relativity predicted if two stars were radiating gravitational waves. Hmm. And then analysis of other, other neutron stars confirmed this. So we began to go into the, the world of gravitational waves. And of course, you know, to some effect, um, uh, my gravity is affecting uh, Paul and Laura, and uh, and theirs is affecting Cindy, and and uh, not to mention Woody and Sherilyn. So so we all do interact, uh, but but uh, but these are huge energetic events uh, that we're we're seeing. So we we have um, uh, uh, we have to detect very minute changes of arm length. Uh, unprecedented, and so it's a very careful, uh, very equipment intensive uh, uh, experiment to do both in space and on the ground. Next slide. Huh. Shows how we're all interdependent, yeah. intertwined, yeah. isn't it? So uh, we we are in 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 a, a different world. We don't have the standard model yet associated with it, but we're getting an understanding of. We're beginning to get an understanding. I would say this is one of the two focus areas of the 21st century uh, right now of, of huge interest. One is the nature and what we can learn from gravitational waves. It's like it's like a whole new view of the universe has opened up to us. And of course, the other is finding exo um, uh Well, maybe a third is finding out what happened at the beginning of the universe. Well, I could probably go on. <laughs> well, I want to just point something out. Gravity, we experience every day in our common everyday reality. Some of the others, we, we are not that cognizant of these effects, but gravity, yes. And it's interesting that that has remained such a mystery and that these strides are now uh, showing new, new information. New, that's going to be a key piece to unlocking the whole picture, isn't it, uh, Tony? Well, the, the, the gravity the gravity effects we're looking at are extremely extremely subtle, but yes, uh, we we know that whenever we have a new tool to look at the universe, yeah. that it will that we will have new views of the universe. Science evolves, mm -hmm. our understanding of science evolves, and there's nothing more exciting to an astronomer than to see something something that doesn't fit with the existing models, and then they proceed. Sherilyn has her hand up. So I'd love to hear what she has to say. Yeah, Tony, just to amplify your meta point that why are gravity waves so exciting, you know, because it opens up this entire other realm of detecting what's happening out there, but setting people up to understand web, um, you know, the other types of messengers that Tony talked about, the electromagnetic and the cosmic rays and things of neutrino, these are passing through the medium of a space-time, right? They are moving in the medium of space-time. Gravitational waves are talking about that medium through which they're passing through exactly. in vibration. So it's the universe itself. What we think of is the space-time of the universe itself vibrating. It's not it's the medium that other messengers are passing through is vibrating. And so that affects 
these other messengers in ways that I'm sure you'll get into a little bit, Tony. So it's really profound, this, this gravitational wave window. It's the universe yeah. itself. In, the universe in itself, the, the medium, that, that's the perfect word the for it. Yeah. The, 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 medium, uh, the medium sends us information. The medium changes. Uh, and, and so it, it all uh, uh, conflates in, in ways that nobody imagined uh, a century ago. The medium sends us information. I'm mm -hmm. quoting you on that. Yeah. Oh, we'll quote Sherilyn on that. No, <laughs> so, no. I'm, 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 I'm nearing the end. It's a plural and, you. And Woody, yeah. Woody, I think you've been involved with both Hubble and Spitzer. Could you say a couple words? Uh, Woody had to go to another meeting. He uh, said, told okay. us in the chat room. Yeah, he was. Oh, okay. Well, well then, um, uh, th these are again simply two pictures showing how different, how different uh, an object can look uh, at two wavelengths. Spitzer is is well into the infrared and Hubble, of course, is visible. Next slide. Huh. So much hidden there, isn't yeah, it? So much hidden. Except until you have the eyes to see it. Hmm. And I'm kind of winding down here. Uh, and this is just the Orion. It's Orion. Uh, Orion, I don't know why I have that here, but, but it's always <laughs> good to look at Orion. It's, Orion. <laughs> it's yeah. up in the sky Orion, right now. Orion so my <laughs> signpost constellations. I always feel happy when I see it. And the nebula in Orion. <laughs> And yeah. next, we can just pound through these pretty quickly, Paul. Okay. What's left? Uh, wow. Yeah, infrared. Okay. But I, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the degree of structure and and uh, when we have our program on the 30th. on the thirtieth, uh, uh, Diana will, will show a, a video of which has done been done by Space Telescope Science Institute, mm. flying through the Orion Nebula. Uh, wonderful, wonderful simulation. So that I think you know, this I, is the kind of stuff we see, and yeah, we yeah. get the. I mean, well, the and this I think this this connects to Tony's point about the firemen, right? I mean, you saw this the obscurity of the smoke in in the optical, and then in the infrared, you see through mm -hmm. to where somebody may be, you know, need of rescue. So this is the same in the interstellar medium, right, where you see. Exactly. The, the visual, you see the starlight, but if you start looking at Orion more deeply in the infrared, um, you know, it also you see more yeah. that's behind the dust, behind the, you know. Mm -hmm. the, We're opening yeah. our bandwidth, yeah. Well, it makes it makes me want to spread my wings and fly through it. And the, the video that, that Diana will show, I think you'll enjoy a lot. Oh, and, looking forward uh, to that. That's Diana okay. Dagomir, that, that Tony's referring yeah. to our upcoming guest, yeah. So. Okay, and, and which structures am I referring to? I when see a hydrogen doing... atom, what are, what are we looking at? Um, okay. okay, well, I think, I think we have wow. a question that I wanted to, to, to touch here. And, and this is monochromatic light. That means that one wavelength only, mm -hmm. and that's at a, a primary transition of the hydrogen atom. And it shows what, 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 the, what it looks like just at this one color without having the other colors uh, conflated into that. So we learned something from that too, from monochromatic light, um, and uh, and that's that's very important. It, it comes from a field called imaging spectroscopy, and and this is this is done from Earth, but it's a uh, uh, it again it's it's another way to look at the light that comes, the information that comes to us from the cosmos. Does anyone see a winged owl? <laughs> yes, I, <do. laughs> I knew Cindy would. <laughs> yeah, Cindy's yeah, waving yeah. her hand. Cindy, you've got a here. So, so going back, back, uh, you know, I think the last few slides have shown structure. What do we mean by structure? We're looking at different densities of gas. We're looking at, at gas and dust. We're looking at at these affected by by the pressure of radiation. Yes, you can sail on radiation pressure. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's my primary duty here. You have to understand that yeah. we can sail on. Uh, you can sail on radiation pressure. It's it. You know, it's, we're we're looking at at these all these things that come together in a way that modifies that modifies what we're seeing. So we're not just looking at at at, at um, gray clouds or things like that. We're looking at marvelously dynamic places where all sorts of physical processes are happening, where stars are being born, where they're dying, where they're exploding, where, um, where stars that are so big you cannot imagine exist, where stars that are so small you cannot imagine exist. Uh, it, it's, um, 
it, it's just a very interesting place. And we learn about it from all these signals that come. Yeah. Opening our bandwidth. So, yeah. Caroline, you, your hand's still up. Do you want to add to this? Oh, 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 I apologize. No, I just forgot to put it yeah. down, but I was going to get, I wanted to amplify that these clouds are places where many stars are being born. That, that, yeah. That's what the Orion Nebula is. And you can see it through binoculars, right? Um, you know, yeah. tonight if you want. We have to add Cindy back in because we have room. So, oh, yeah. so I, uh, yeah, this is beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Because I, I love what you said. The medium sends us info. All that wavelength, particles, energy, da 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 da. It's flowing through us. There's no paper mm -hmm. bag around Earth. We're part of it, we're in the stream. Right? It's all flowing through us as well. It's operating on us. We share those same patterns. That's what's so beautiful and so glorious about it. We can we see the infinitesimal, but we also see the infinite. We see it in both directions. And uh, and Tony, tell us what you're showing us. Okay, tell I'm us trying to story. find the right place in it here. Uh, let's see, here it is, I guess, in part. You can't really see this, but I want to tell you a little story. Uh, uh, Sometimes interesting things come to me, and this is a scarf which which uh, came to me a few years ago, and it's of the artwork that was done when when the two black holes collided in 2016, and uh, and an illustration of this, since you can't really quite take a picture of it, this was found by gravity waves, was being yeah, produced. You're just talking about yeah. Produced by by an artist in in Northern California, and in the midst of preparing this. Uh, a fire was coming down and she had to leave her house with only her laptop and go to a motel and complete this and get it in by deadline. So this took on an inner meeting, inner meaning for her in some way. And she decided she had to have a scarf made, but the minimum order is six. And, and from magic, I, I was able to get one of the six. There's only six in existence. Oh my. Yeah. I want to point out that Sherilyn, you are also an artist as we celebrate the arts to the sciences and you sing and compose and play instruments. Yes. Wow. You know, I think the integration of art and science in education is essential. It's, I no longer believe that it, you, you know, you have to sneak it in and be on the corner about that. I'm, I'm now fearless about it. it. There's just no, no, no question. And I appreciate environments like these when, where people like Tony and me can be our complete selves, mm. right? I mean, normally, you know, when Tony is in a meeting and you know, for NASA, he's, he's not showing them his paintings, right? <laughs> you know, and and uh, so, uh, it's not, you know, and it's like. In education, we have a little bit more license to do that integration. And, you know, there are, it's basically art, science, spirit, psychology. Yeah. It's, you know, it's like I'm working with indigenous people in my work and they give license also to have this integration be a part of the. Right. You know, if, if I could just, just add in uh, one nice development that's happened in some of the astronomical meetings. Uh, where there'll be there'll be a room and they invite a scientist to come and draw their astrophysics to, ah, to yeah. art from that. so there's a little bit of uh there's a little bit of combining the worlds happening even on that side too mm -hmm. but, but, but this is a, a wonderful wonderful format and <laughs> and uh, it, it's a privilege to be able to to share some information with you and and, and what what fuels my world we also learned something else from you today, Tony, and that is is that you can be an astrophysicist, you can work for NASA, you can travel the world lecturing, but when you get home, the dogs are in charge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cindy, your thoughts, and then I want to um, just talk a little bit more about yeah. the apparatus and get your, your feedback on that, because yeah. some of this is quite sophisticated okay. that science is finding. But um, just your thoughts. It doesn't help you as an artist to see from the sciences to see um, what what the, that technology is pulling in, and how does it compare to the inner technology? What is pulling in? I'm asking because you're right there. <laughs> I have my own answer to that, but I want to hear yours. Yeah. I think I'm fascinated um, by Sherilyn also mentioning the owl, but I kept seeing things when their images came up. So there was definitely a man with a skeleton face and one coming up, <laughs> almost rattling. And I thought, okay. 
Um, definitely beautiful. Like, uh, uh, what is it saying? What's it communicating? And what a fascinating presentation today because I, I felt it as well. I think um, kinesthetically felt that truth. Yeah. Well, we've put our finger to the wind and we, we go, what, what feels right? We go with that. Mm -hmm. And I'm amazed by how many stars showed up that I did not expect in the select of the paintings that you did in the, uh, the, uh, Kurdish flag, there was another star and mm. they're just all over the place. They wanted to be shining represented. today yeah. and represented today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was the also cosmos really is fun. saying, celebrate us. We are here. You are of us. Yeah. We are you are you are our ancestors. Uh, yeah. I always say to the stars, "I'm born of you." Yeah. I have this really. I feel that yeah. part of the art, Sherilyn, you can speak to this, is that we need a personal connection with our home, and we are truly living in our fullest capacity when we embrace the cosmos as our home. And this is something that I love. This passage in the River Y, the book, that the narrator Gus describes the difference between um, those of us living in our Western mode and the indigenous native mode. And he describes how in, the, in the, our Western mode, we wake up, we're in a bed, we're in a room, we're in a house, we're in a town, we're in a state, we're in a country, and we are bound by all these layers. And then he describes a native elder as stepping out and the wind and the songs of the birds and the rippling of the waves and the sky and and he's aware of everything his entire space mm -hmm. is is that he dresses himself in the robe of the cosmos as he puts it he looks up and it's all his home and i really felt that part of that is why paul and i have pursued the indigenous mindset so deeply to feel at home in our own skin and I remember going back to Kuyamange and talking to a native elder there from the Tasuki tribe, oh, yeah. Louis Hanna. And mm -hmm. we were on uh, this ancient village site, which now was no longer there, Active. just a pottery shards and some points Physically there. not, yeah. And he's describing what this is like. I'll, I tell the whole story elsewhere, but I'll just quote one space. And he said, you may ask us as we look down the valley is hemmed by the Hemes Mountains over here, the San Cristo Mountains here. And you could see down this valley. And he said, what is our home like? That was the question. What was it like here back in the day, 2,000 years ago, when there were 1,500 people here in four-story Pueblo buildings? Yes, he said, this floor of our valley was the floor of our home. And these mountains were the walls. Look above us. The ceiling, the cloud, the Milky Way, the arm of the Milky Way was our ceiling. And here was our pharmacopoeia, the plants that grew. And here was our bread basket, what we grew in our fields. And this is our home. And I thought, yeah, to embrace the cosmos, to live fully, to have an energetic and direct experience of that to hear it talk to us directly, mm -hmm. to embrace it. That's the home that I want, to know that it's all sacred and that I am part of it. We are all part of it. That mindset has got to be the key to unlock us in changing the way that we're treating ourselves and mm. our earth and the mm. fellow citizens and the web of life, to know that those patterns of nature live in us. That's the whole key here, and that's why we do the work that we do, because it helps us open up that bandwidth directly. And I applaud you scientists who come and share this space with us, and you have done these postures with us. Sherilyn, I can read your beautiful experience, if I may, from the same solstice, the same Venus of Galgenberg. Do you want to cite it, or should I? Because I wrote down your words. Oh my gosh. I that would be fascinating to hear that. <laughs> because you I said, was just, wow. <laughs> I felt a conduit open up between my hands, antenna to the heavens, the stars, the sun, to the earth, and seeing oneself in the sunlight, the joyful feeling of bringing energy to earth, each of us being a conduit for this light. 
celebrating the return of life through the heart. Mm. Mm. Wow. wow. That's yeah. beautiful. I know these are fleeting experiences, but part of journaling them is to record them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. And, and it's, it's just, this has been really a fantastic example of how we want, some, we've been taught to segregate things that somehow they're independent of each other. And it's so, such a it's misunderstanding yeah. when you start connecting Dissolve all the dots. Dissolve the boundaries uh, and Ness, expand. Ness Happy said, thank you, Tony. Reminds me of a saying attributed to a couple of the ancient Egyptian deities. Ra, I'm so large, everything is in me. And Autumn said, I'm so small, I'm in everything. That dynamic interplay of the large and, and the small structures. those are the structures. sages of the ages that are saying the same thing. We are right. one with the all. And our message is that we all have that capacity. We all have that switch within. Mm -hmm. Flip it on and know that directly. Not through the intellect, but directly, emotionally, experientially, energetically. Mm -hmm in addition to the intellect. Because what you, Tony, and, um, and, and Sherilyn bring is the intellectual amazement to this. Sherilyn, you speak so beautifully of beholding the cosmos yeah. through, through that witnessing. And Cindy, what are you, as you speaking on behalf of all artists everywhere in all mediums, <laughs> to imbibe <laughs> that, to hear the muse deliver that, and then to put it out in a symbolic fashion for us to share. And that's what our ancient ancestors, that's the legacy that yeah. we yeah, are yeah. celebrating with Galgenberg. Raise your arm to the sky and celebrate mm -hmm. it here. Cosmos, come down. Yeah, yeah. Come down. Yeah. And but the cosmos is, I, I have to interject that the cosmos is here. Yes. It is here that we we are the cosmos also, yes. right? I mean, and uh, we, it's that's part of one of the fundamental separations we have a tendency to do in our education. That all that stuff Tony showed, you know, that's out there, and we're here as if here is not the cosmos also, and and that that I think is it's in our language to say it another way. So I just and I know that that. Uh, that's what you meant, Laura. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, you know, but it's, it's it's interesting that it's in our language to separate them, when in fact the we really the you know, it, uh, the sky begins at our feet. You know, the the earth is in the cosmos, Beautiful. and that's part of what I want to bring to science education. I do not understand why the electromagnetism that Tony was describing, you know, and the electromagnetic waves that are so fundamental to our understanding. Um, uh, you know, it's not, I had a, I taught a room full of junior biology majors. And I said, for the next two days before our next class, go out and see what's electromagnetic. What's electromagnetic in your world? These are biologists. And they came back. And not one of them, of hundreds of them, said the body, the human body. Mm. Right? I mean, the your heart doesn't beat and your brain doesn't work unless there's electromagnetic energy. There's electromagnetic energy in every cell. If you're not electric, you're dead, right? And so the, the, the electromagnetic phenomenon is part of you. And yet we don't teach it as if the science that we understand is part of right. us. Right. And that, that's the connection that we want to make in our outreach efforts, right? Is to bring this, uh, this, these other truths together and that what Tony was showing us gives us an opportunity not only to connect with the natural rhythms of our world or reconnect, I'll say, because we've become very disconnected, but now to include that cosmos that we're becoming aware of because of these messengers we've learned how to receive, um, you know, and so I just think that's a very exciting possibility for educators, whether art educators or anthropological educators or science educators, to begin to really focus on that connection. Just to add to what Sherilyn said, I uh, remember in graduate school, I was doing my thesis research, and um, I had a very sensitive device called an electrometer. It operated, I think, at 10 to the 16th ohms. And I was absolutely fascinated with this instrument as I held it anywhere near my body, how strong the signal was, and, and uh, that I could make almost direct measurements of my body several feet away from it, but I, I could tell it was there. I've always yeah. wanted to play with this since. I, I don't know if anybody yeah. has. I'm sure somebody has. Maybe it's too Reichian uh, or something like that. But anyway, I, I, I had a very strong impression of how electric I am at that point. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was, of course, I knew it, but this was visceral. This, this, this made it real. That's why hands on healers are, you know, energy away from the body, right? It's there. Get my Reiki, my Reiki instructor vibration. taught us we're all energetic healers. It's a question of whether we activate yeah. it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, you know she she opened up with us doing this kind of you know rubbing our hands and yeah. literally oops it's in you too uh huh hello you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to give just a quick report on some of the technology on a physiological level that scientists and I really want to invite Stephen uh, Reppert he's doing some extraordinary I want to get your reaction to it the, the Go ahead. science. Um, he's doing some extraordinary research with the antenna of butterfly mm -hmm. and uh, also fruit flies. He's saying that there are, um, uh, yeah, really sophisticated technology embedded even in the tiny little tips of the antenna of a butterfly that serve as a solar compass and a solar clock. And it helps monarch butterflies navigate from here in North America all the way to Mexico to overwinter and then back again. A tiny butterfly with those gossamer little wings and and they navigate and they travel that kind of distance. I mean, that's like distance like migratory birds, mm. right? Or whales. I mean, that's, uh, and how do they do that? They have a 24 hour solar clock in their antenna and um, 100 million monarch butterflies migrate on an annual basis. They wondered how this happened. Some of the um, studies that they're doing, um, and this was in the journal Science and Elsewhere, they wanted to look for the location of the clock inside the antenna rather than the brain. And this is from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. They're looking into the role um, also for the social reactions of monarchs because, of course, they're safer mm. in groups. And they have this flight simulator they did. They removed the antenna from a group of butterflies. They um, compared it to the control group with their antenna. And the intact butterflies could all fly as normal. The insects without their antenna, though they flew strongly, headed off in random directions. They went further to discover that the antenna are a major site of their circadian clock for the butterflies. And it compensates for the movement of the sun, which they also use to migrate. So many migrating species use the sun, and their eyes can filter where the sun is, even under clouds. So they have that uh, capacity. They tested this molecular cycles of the, of the circadian clock in the brains of the butterflies, um, and they said it compensated for the orientation of the sun. Totally a surprise. So they've got backup. They've got redundancy technology on board, like any good pilot would have, right? One instrument goes out or is inoperational, you back up on another. Um, and they found that the antenna clock can sense light independently from the brain and can function, it's so, so necessary. And he said, what's so cool about what we did is it suggests that these clocks have a function directly related to the brain itself, a really regulating a central brain process so the idea that it's not just all in our brain, our whole bodies are involved with this and talking to uh, different, different uh, sensors. They have a light sensor and a clock. They painted one set of antenna with black paint, disengaged them, painted another with transparent paint they could still uh, fly. And that's just the butterflies. He's also finding, because his lab specializes in the biomechanical um, mechanisms underlying these these uh, processes, these receptor sites, mm -hmm. that we have cryptochrome in our eyes, human beings. In fact, all of life does. This interesting molecule that's implicated not just in the regulation of our all of our circadian rhythms, these body clocks, and many of the navigational skills of migratory birds, sea turtles, the butterflies, the fruit fly, and us. Do we have a migratory component in our history? Um, but it's really in all of life. And so these chromosomes in our eyes detect the electromagnetic field mm. and Earth's magnetic field. We know that we have magnetite in our ethmoid bone. We have magnetite in our, in our brains. We know that we're tuned to this. Right. But these also in our eyes is what is so curious. And so they think that maybe we turn this off because they have a high need for superoxidase, which is a free radical, 
in a short-lived species, not a big deal, in a long-lived species like us, we might have traded in something that would disrupt DNA over time uh, that this, this feeds on. But we have these receptors in our eyes. When they took, and they wanted to experiment with, what about the human? There's two types of this uh, cryptochrome receptor, the human type and, and another type. They put the human type in the eyes of flies, mm -hmm. and they could then re-engage the mechanism. Mm -hmm. So it works, even though we may not read out our relationship with the Earth's magnetic field necessarily, it f the same function in our eyes is there. And so I just want to read one quote, and he says, do we have it? Have we lost it? He's, um, two things that he says, it's perfectly reasonable to think that humans have a magneto, magnet, sensing response. Maybe we've been looking at it in a way that's not been fruitful in the past. We, we interviewed a woman who could sense earthquakes mm -hmm. before they happened. She was on record for doing that multiple times. We talked about that when the snakes awake, a book that documents oh, the many yeah. animal species who can sense disruptions in earthquakes, tsunamis. They've got early warning alerts right. and they take cover. So we know, we know other species do this and a few humans apparently. So it could be like circadian rhythms. We do not respond to the magnetic field directly, but we react to it perhaps without knowing that we do. I'm suggesting that this is one of the many senses that we possibly have that explains some of our experience in our trance state. Well, when mm -hmm. you feel that magnetic pull, unmistakable, you feel like in your mm -hmm. tractor beam, maybe that's activated. Mm -hmm. We've got these dormant senses within us and we, we created a whole list of what these are. Um, he said, uh, Stephen Rupert went on to say, I would be very surprised if we don't have this sense. It's used in a variety of other animals. I think the issue is to figure out how we use it. And he characterizes his results as overwhelming in proving humans do have and do use magnetoreception. And now he's focusing on nobody knows how this occurs or it, this information is transferred into the nervous system, but we can imagine what that sensation is like, he says. We can ask if it is like our other senses tuning into Earth's magnetic field may be activated. Um, in these, I'm just saying that this is an example um, of some of the sensory apparatus that nature has designed to pull in these subtler aspects of our electromagnetic field, right. of our cosmic soup. And we know that we have magnetite. We know that, um, that sharks can sense the bioelectric imprint of a fish, even if it's under the sand and not visible. We know that dung beetles can navigate by the light of the Milky Way. They, the little tiny insect has receptors so sensitive that it can f take this faint starlight from a group of stars making the arm of the Milky Way and navigate and push their little dung ball in a straight line, uh, according to that. Right. I mean, we know that there are physiological creations by nature to open up the bandwidth and these other creatures, insects that see UV, uh, insects that u right. UV. Gerald Pollack talks about the fact that we might be receptive to some of this, like infrared, because it heightens the energy that could be in our cells with his fourth state of water he's describing. Mm -hmm. Infrared activates this and makes us feel more alive. So nature would equip us with this stuff to seek it out, right? To seek it out and to be tuned to it and to know where we should navigate and be. I'm just saying that this, and I take full poetic license. I'm an English lit major. It's in my domain to say I can make connections in a mythopoetic way, and it's okay. It's okay to speculate mm. that we have more receptors than we know. Mm. Our physiology is more interesting and complex and can open up the bandwidth greater than we know. And That's in trance, great. we seem to experience this greater <clears throat> bandwidth 
perhaps that's what's activating it. I mean, that's the core of this institute is understanding yeah. that that aspect yeah. of what what became dormant or not no longer used, and that Flip we have the this switch. capacity. You know, Flip that, the switch on. Yeah. You know, that normal reality versus this this alternate reality, as Dr. Goodman talked about, and and that this all should be. It's integrated. not so alternate. It's not alternate, right? Well, exactly. I don't think it's so alternate. Take I think that, that we right. close the door right. and we want to raise the shields again, and uh, and yeah. And this is a topic that we've been following, well, throughout our entire time we've been supernature. together. Supernature. Yeah, yeah, supernature. The whole concept of supernature, and that is that um, things that in the in the human experience we say, oh, that's that's you know extra sensory perception, that's ESP, that's outside of the norm, that's weird or whatever. But you look to nature, and it's all. What are we picking up? It's all there. It's all there. Up? And I promised David Elkington, who talks a lot about and has done in our interviews before, oh. the ethmode bone, okay. where the magnetite resides, this little yeah. molecule of iron that incorporates itself into a cell, and it's tuned to our magnetic field. Right. And he fi figures that the ethmoid bone was, bone was broken and removed when Egyptians mummified the body because that ties us to Earth's magnetic field. If we're sensing it, we're tied to it. And if you want to send the soul, which their uh, journey of the afterlife included, sending souls back to the stars from whence they came, uh, you needed to break that connection to Earth. And so, and this will be an interesting one on the 30th, Tony, when we talk with Diana Dagomir and yourself about astrobiology. Aren't we each tuned to our own home planet? Aren't mm. we tethered in these ways that our own inner instruments are tuned to the planet we're cement to be on? Right. And what are the implications for space travel in the future? Mm. Or will we evolve if there's a colony on another exoplanet? We would, I'm assuming, evolve to tune to that planet, that would be for our own survival. And so that might be the punctuated equilibrium of a whole lot of evolution taking place to tune to it. I don't know. And, and even coming back to the, the energy fields surrounding, surrounding us, I mean, I, you know, we did that interview many years ago um, and continued several discussions with Dr. Valerie Hunt. Uh, who wrote a book, Science of Human Vibrations of a Consciousness. Um, and uh, she was a research professor. Unfortunately, she's passed away uh, many years ago. But uh, we interviewed her four or five times. And uh, she did some significant work at the documentation. Reading an aura. What people considered an aura that, no, they're yeah. this, this, yeah, exactly. It goes way beyond. So anyway, that's on our She was doing website, measurements of frequencies our, and then correlating them to vision visions of auras. That's one of the podcasts on our website if you're interested in following up on that as well. Yep. So, well, um, did you want to comment on that, Tony, what Laura just uh, brought up? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> A little bit too hot for you, Tony. <laughs> Good. A bit too speculative. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. And then either. Okay. How about you, Cheryl Lynn? Cheryl Lynn Woods. <laughs> <laughs> and so does. <laughs> You're all tenured. You're safe. It, yeah. Uh, it, well, uh, you see, what this is why I'm in education because you know there's an interface there. There's a little bit more of a license to not be the you know a leading edge research scientist and 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 how we teach these things. I, I feel like, for example, related to your point, the use of the word alien, I, I've kind of excised it from my vocabulary because alien to what? Mm. Right? And the way we're yeah. speaking about our interconnection with the cosmos, you know, we can speak about an adaptation to a particular world and there are evolutionary principles, right, that we think yeah. about there. You're adapted to your environment. That which survives, you know, has um, developed uh adaptations that work for their environment right okay yeah we, we can all agree there and that might be true on a planetary scale right um it will certainly true but i think there's also this idea that you know if somebody is off comes from off earth then they're alien we talk of aliens we talk of people who are not of this country yeah it is aliens, a word that needs to be <laughs> right required. right you know, they're the yeah. same species, there's the same, you know, I have the same heart and brain and we call them alien because they're not, you know, born in this country or something. I just think- I want to say I was not invoking the word in that context. Yeah. So no, I want no, to be no, very no. clear. Yeah. Well, no, no. And I didn't, I, don't, I didn't mean that. It just excited that my little soapbox in regards to alien to what and, and that, you know, 
you can go all the way at, to the cosmic level of our universe. You know, if you're a being in this universe, right? I, so I use extraterrestrial if you mean mm -hmm. someone okay. off, off, the planet. Yeah. off Earth, off planet. Yeah. Um, you know, that's very clear. That's exactly what that means, right? Extraterrestrial. Something. And someday we're going to look at that as somebody, the same way as we see somebody living on the other side of the Earth, right? In a different, different locale. Yeah. There will well, be we a don't time, even have I the predict. global sense of being, yeah. you know, the same species, right? And, yeah. yeah, we're working on it, right? But, you yeah. know, so some of us want us to be cosmic citizens as well, right? And to just stretch that sense of belonging to a cosmos in a, in a way that helps bring us together as a tiny little planet. And mm. truly, if we see the cosmos as our home, then we're going to see everything as part of our larger cosmic family. Yeah. We will get to that stage, I predict. Uh, I was yeah. just going to go back to, we were talking about the century thing, and, and Miriam had shared that actually she used to get really uh, shaking uh, before a major earthquake. She could feel it. Anyway, oh, she said she had to, she had to, tell us about that. She said that. she had to shut it off because it was just too spooky for her. She had to stop allowing that to be one of her perceptions yeah. that she yeah. could feel. Yeah. You know, I really do feel like we have more control over the sensory input. I once had really sensitive hearing to the point where I just, it was just driving, hearing too much. And I just, mm -hmm. please dial it down to where we find that medium level where we're comfortable. Right. And I think probably that is why we we're so focused on this reality. We're meant to be here, live this life in this reality. And we have to shutter off everything else to focus, though we can open it up on occasion. We need to focus and get life done here. Right. So we have that option. Open, mm. close, open, close, just like any good, healthy membrane of a cell. It's discerning what it wants to let in and when right. that's the job of a cell membrane. And it's very intelligent about that. I have a little I think story. That's a I like healthy to... function. Go ahead, Tony. I have a little story I'd like to tell if I could. Sure. And it's about aliens. Ooh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. And, uh, uh, when I was in graduate school, I invited Carl Sagan to come and speak at the University of Pennsylvania. And he said, yes, I will come provided I can speak on two consecutive nights. And I said, well, that sounds fine. And then he told me what the topics were. The first topic was, is there life on Earth? And the second topic, is there life on Mars? In the first lecture, he depicted the Martians fascinated by this blue planet with polar caps. And then they started getting a telescope and they started discovering canals. And eventually they sent a space probe to orbit Earth and they saw what that it was populated. They saw what the people were and they felt so sorry for them. As the, as the people moved up and down the canals, whenever they'd stop, uh, they would have um, uh, bugs, creatures uh, crawling out of them. <laughs> Uh, you know, like lice crawling out of them. Well, guess who the lice were? Us people <laughs> getting, getting in and out of cars. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. Take it from a different perspective. Yeah, yeah. So 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 that kind of emphasizes what what Sherilyn has to say in a, in a way in a different way, and and this was uh, Carl's uh, perspective. I want to share one other aspect because here you are who could answer this to this cryptochrome molecule. And I got this off the web from looking at Stephen Reppert's work that says, also a quantum compass is how researchers describe this cryptochrome, cryptochrome molecule that detects very small, subtle, geomagnetically induced variations in the spin of electrons struck by photons. Mm. From those variations, animals seem to be able to determine their orientation in relation to Earth's magnetic field. Oh. I mean, are you getting down to the quantum level here where you can detect the spin of electrons and the geomagnetically induced variations in that? I mean, we are picking up such subtle realms, such subtleties. I, I just find that extraordinary. Um, I'd like to raise a point that um, another artist on the call has uh, raised in the chat yes. um, about the possibility of, uh, you know, having capacities that have atrophied, right? Having capacities that, you know, 
like I, I remember reading about telepathy and how it's still active in, in Aboriginal cultures in Australia, right? I mean, yeah. because the environment demands it, right? I mean, these days, you know, we, we it, maybe we had more capacity for detecting and transmitting and receiving various types of information that we are have let go unexercised. And some of us emerge more sensitive than others to, to different things. And we kind of think of them as freaks, but in fact, maybe that was more common to all of us. And it's not so freakish. And that's one of the things that's intrigued me about the Institute is just, hey, we all with our innate physiology have some capacity, like my Reiki teacher, you have mm -hmm. capacities that you assign to someone who's super magical and there may be gifted people in that domain but that we all have some some kind of capacity in that direction that we we are that is unexercised and i wonder if bianca if you have anything more you'd like to, to add or contribute to the conversation in in yeah. that in while that you get uh, bianca on the screen i just want to also say i saw a television report on a blind man who was using sonar to walk around, navigate, go yeah. around objects. Mm -hmm. He was making clicking noises and the bounce back allowed him to create a mental picture so he knew go left, go right, stop, go around. He could navigate beautifully through an obstacle course by clicking. And so the question also is what kind of picture in the mind does this make? What kind of mental imagery does our processing center in our brain create that we can do this mm -hmm. and what are those abilities that we don't even know we have until somebody shows you and you get permission to do it rub your hands we had a worked with Ipu Piara he goes feel this everybody yeah. do it individually oh it feels hot it feels it feels textured it feels pointy mm -hmm. it feels smooth everybody got the same thing individually mm -hmm. we can pick mm -hmm. up more than we know that's right so yeah. yes yeah. hello Bianca <laughs> Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. As always, fascinating discussions, and I'm always so honored to even sit at the table with Tony and Sherilyn and Fred and people who are just so studied in, in all these different factions. And I always feel like a, a lowly little explorer in my world, just doing um, my own work in, in exploring um, what are these. In my particular interest at the moment is what are those senses and and i want to talk to you definitely some more about what your list is of the senses that are atrophied in that sense um i have been taught to to you know explore some of these and um uh so i'm very curious to explore this more because i had like the lady that was saying um i had to shut down this sense that i felt the earthquakes i also in a very similar way had to shut down things because I had to tend to um, more this here and now um, matters that, that took my focus. And it is in the end what we focus on. And we have the right, it's like you're saying, we all have the ability and the right to explore these to the extent that we can dream, that we can imagine, that we can visualize. And there's so much that we're sharing. And I think your forum is so powerful for that because we're looking at all these different angles and say, what does each person have to contribute? And what 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 conduit are is each of us? And um, so that, that exploration, I think, is worthwhile. I want to and say there's that- a beautiful uh, artist out that um, Hilma F. Glint, that was just in Sydney. A, a lot of psychologists refer to her. Her paintings, she was Austrian. She uh, did these amazing paintings. And then she locked them up for a hundred years mm -hmm. and said that we weren't ready to look at them. And they've now been, oh. I know they were at the Guggenheim. Mm -hmm. They were just in Sydney. I think oh. they're in New Zealand and then they'll be going back to Austria. But what she was showing looks like the Hubble telescope, but it was 1800s. Hilda, I read about her. Hilma. 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 H-I-L-M-A. Off. Clint. I'll show How do you spell? It? Okay, Paul's finding that. K L I N T. Yeah, Paul's finding that. Um, I just want to mention, since Bianca's here, that uh, thank you to Tony 
for introducing us to Sherilyn and to Bianca and Fred Smith and so many uh, marvelous uh, people exploring with us. So thank you, Tony. And Bianca, you will be joining us in February wow. with a colleague to talk about your personal experiences with intention so that we can understand the power of intention. And I want to hear your, your stories, uh, firsthand uh, mm. stories. And we're going to explore that in depth with you and a colleague. So, Let's hope so, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. So, because yeah. uh, we, yeah, we I, I want to quickly yeah. go back to the, um, um, this ties into the paintings that were locked away for a hundred years. And I'm sorry if I say your name wrong, Nesapi. Um, <clears throat> you were talking just really about the intricacy on how we're tethered to the planet mm -hmm. and, and that you, you, you're bound to a silence. And I want to say that, you know, even the Tetzcatlipoca tradition, which some of the people at our um, table study, um, have gone into into silence and into retreat because we realized that we weren't at a conscious evolution to actually release that information. And they they very recently have opened that up. And I think that is true for many traditions the world over. Um, and, and Fred, I'd love to talk to you about that some more because I know so much of the knowledge is held uh, very closely for the fear of contamination and for misunderstanding and mis evolving if there is such a thing. Um, but but there is a sense that we are we are at a moment certainly in a greater um, uh, sphere to say we are opening up. Let us open up and let's just see where we go because if we don't, we are certainly not on a very good trajectory right now. Right. Um, on the planet. And, and and I think your work is wonderful for that. I really have enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, Fred, you were invited to, to talk, Marianne. <laughs> Who else wants to say something? Well, come on. So this is the chance. Ms. Hoppy, come on. I want to hear what you put in the chat because I haven't had time to read it. Well, so. if someone turns on their um, microphone, I'll know they want to speak. Otherwise, yeah, I won't force anybody to speak. But Paul's very diplomatic like well, that. I just, yeah. Yeah. I didn't want to be on camera. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. so anyway, well, I mean, I think that the, the power of the conversation today, going from this whole concept of, of uh, yeah. being able to go from the inner to the outer, from the the, the, the minute to the... Open up our bandwidth. Uh, yeah, the whole concept of bandwidth. Yeah. Um, I think the universe is talking with us and um, all the time. So let's just consciously engage in that dialogue. Mm -hmm. Let's hear from the wisdom of the stars and uh, from creation, from life. Sing the song of life. Yeah. And by the way, um, if we can persuade your friend Woody to come back and show us Hubble telescope pictures, images, I would like to contrast that with uh, Hilma's paintings and see how much they look like that. Oh. <laughs> Wouldn't that be interesting? Well, to see if indeed there was a painter a hundred years ago who was picking up those images before we had the eyes to see it right. uh, directly. Yeah, the, the flash that was shown of her work, which was quite enjoyable. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Tony and Woody are, you know, optical experts, and there's a uh, geometry in in the, those paintings that I think might be stimulating for for folks who know what they know so oh my gosh so even the geometry and the hardware that came to become this mm -hmm. giant receptor site in the sky either, either way you know ray the ray ray optics tony right you know and the way you think yeah, about you know, axis and off axis optics and that kind of thing it's yeah. immediately i saw my physics book with these kinds of you know lenses mm -hmm. and mirrors you know and doing the reflections and well, well this is what what he does what he is the exactly. designer designer in america if not the world yeah, I mean, he, he, he designed the glasses, as I understand, for the Hubble Space Telescope, the, the correction, when the mirror was found to be polished, you know, not quite right. And this is why Tony's work, he was the lead guy for getting the, you know, the web telescope mirrors polished right. And so there was this tremendous pressure on his team to get that right because the predecessor telescope had failed to get it right, you know. 
Wow. Tony, thank you for your service <laughs> yeah. and all the amazing work you do. Paul's well, going to well, show. Well, let, let me okay. say we would see people from Washington about every three weeks. Are you doing it right? Yes. <laughs> uh, are, are you aware that there are earthquakes in California? Yeah. Uh, yeah like that. Wow. Oh, look well, at these images. Wow. Look at that. Wow. Yeah, this isn't from the Guggenheim. Uh, this yeah. is from, this is Hilma off Clint, A-F-K-L-I-N-T, off Clint. Thank you for yeah. bringing her up, Cindy. And she's on. Oh, and these are her altar paintings. These were the last three. There's three that she did. They're enormous. I uh, fortunately got to see it before they locked down. And oh. uh, they say that Guggenheim in New York, the building was designed on a concept she drew and saw and visions. So the spiral. Uh, it, yeah, the spiral. She's mm -hmm. quite amazing. And she has a, a series of paintings called Our Life, right from when we're born through to when we pass. They're enormous. And you walk in a, a room, but it's incredible work. Oh, wow. my. And when did she live? 100 years ago, you said? In the 18 uh, 19, about 18 to 19. Uh, oh, I should know. I started studying her. Um, but um it, her work was just oh, regarded okay. as quite out there she went into trance so she was part of a school where she would go into trance and these are the paintings that came out of her trance states and then she in her later life well after she locked these away she was quite an accomplished landscape artist uh trained at school and then she started just painting the essence of flowers and items around her in watercolor mm. and those images kind of look like what you did tony so you'd kind of want to look at that book well, yeah. <laughs> and it became very very yeah uh different so she was very and they awesome. there was a molecular scientists and other scientists what, have actually what commented what is sorry that what is that book called um oh well there's a lot there's of so many books there's so many books out on her but I'll, i can send that to lauren to paul and yeah. email it to you okay, there, some it. of her best books i can get you to the best books of hers well, thank oh you. thank you let's have a whole sunday and celebrate how art can anticipate the sciences and encapsulate it right they say um uh, cubism was really an expression of some of the strides we made in science there's so much on that. Yeah. So thank you. Oh. She was born in 1862, it said, yeah. uh, on the, okay. the Google. Thank you, Paul, for doing that. <laughs> I want to end today with the picture of the Venus of Galgenberg okay. and um, Cindy's drawing of oh, that. Okay. So Because that's where we really started. Because I was looking at that, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how beautiful that an image from 32,000 years ago yeah. and our experience of it is so replete with this launch of this telescope, one of many that is out there to open our bandwidth and really welcome in. In this work, we are welcoming in. We are standing at the door and greeting, the proverbial uh, door, and greeting and ushering in this cosmic energy, this expansion of knowledge, joy, creativity, life, life force. We are here. That must be the intention you talk of, Bianca, because I think that Ritual is about focusing the intention, creating a safe container to open up the bandwidth and then let it all pour down on us. Yeah. So, um, and I think Thomas Ritchie will talk about that next, next week. week. We, we talks about the elements of ritual, but here are there are many ways of opening the bandwidth. Let's celebrate the earliest ways that we've found, the ways that are continually relevant and accessible to all of us as we celebrate all the scientists who have worked so hard and we've had three of them in the room today, uh, yeah, the astrophysicists, cool. so thank you, and the artists, and all of us who are there so to please. celebrate uh, celebrate life. I would like to remind people, since they're ending on the Venus, uh, that the Venus is passing between Sun and Earth. Um, that's just a scientific fact. And so you will see her, those of you who have a low western horizon, you see this very bright light near to the horizon uh, after sunset in the west. And she will disappear for a week or two, depending on your horizon, and reappear as a morning star shortly before sunrise in the east. And so mm. as that transition, she comes on the inner track between Earth and sun, 
she will change from a morning star or for an, from an evening star to a morning star. So those of you who have good horizons to east and west can be attentive uh, to that, and that feels like a a lovely thing to be uh, you know paying attention to in your real cosmos, in terms of a, you know attuning to the rhythms that we're talking about uh, somewhat abstractly. And I would say that mythically, the goddess Venus, the goddess is standing at the portal to our birth and to our death and to our rebirth. Mm. So it's so beautiful that there we assign Venus, that goddess image and, and mythic role of being the morning and the evening. She's covering all the bases. She's the bookend. Uh, and, well. and thank you all for so. sending your resurrecting energy to the devastation here in Boulder, Colorado mm. uh, in recent days. I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. We're suffering that pretty badly. Um, yeah. But uh, I want to show you all this. I want to take Can some people. Yeah, one second here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's in Boulder. And that's from so Boulder, that's, too. That's, that's the view out my window. Um, but the view in the two towns within a few miles of us is not so beautiful. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, um, Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, thank you, Cheryl the, Ann. Yeah. And, and thank you, Tony. Tony last words, and then we're going to show the Venus. Um, and let I just the showed it. speak. I just showed oh, it. Did, I missed it. Yeah, you were speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I missed it. Yeah, yeah. You can see it again, but yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And Tony. I'm so delighted uh, that you, you uh, came and participated today, Cheryl Ann. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome the anytime. Tony. Cheryl Ann and I are cooking up a little project it's the to, Tony to celebrate. Yeah. yeah, the Tony tribe. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Final well, words, Tony? Well, yeah, this, this has been really fun, and I, and I love widening our bandwidth because that's really what we're doing. Yeah. And I think we're discovering these things everywhere we look, whether it's it's a painting in a curd restaurant or or uh, as we look at the universe, I mean, doors are opening up. I mean, if when I was in graduate school, if I talked about gravity waves, people would say, uh, oh, you're crazy. You, you can't do this. <laughs> and, and, but, not, but now it's it's the hottest thing in science. And, and I love how all this is evolving, how we're going toward and uh, and and then the connections of the monarchs that Laura talked about. Um, so many things are, are, are just uh, um, just can't ignore them. They're, they're just they're just here. It's a really good way to you, you, the theme broadening the, is a great theme to connect these very diverse realms that we're talking about. And Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. Well done. Yeah. And to appreciate our role in it as instruments that with that we can open and close. Yeah. yeah. And well, well this, this has been very fun today, and I, I, I really, you. really appreciate all of you from, from listening. I hope I wasn't too Astro 101 like, but <laughs> well, you were that. Astro 505 in places, yeah, Tony. My. But it's okay. <laughs> we you we know. needed it. We enjoyed that. <laughs> Thank you to our guest, um, Cindy, uh, good and your beautiful art and alerting us to yes, your art you. and that process mm. of the muse. Thank you all. This has been a, a fun launch for a whole new year, a whole new yeah. cycle. We're widening the, the bandwidth. the adventures that we have going. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, I said we're widening the bandwidth. Go ahead. Right on. Yeah. That's the concept. Yeah. yeah. That's well, our theme for the year. That's our theme for the year. Yeah. 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 Is that right? Widening the bandwidth, yes. All right. Well, well, blessings to all of you, and uh, thank all you right. so much for your participation. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you both, Paul and Laura. Okay.